What's up guys and welcome to the PFCFL week 9 recap. So uh, this week I'm with Jeff Bridges. Hey guys, what's going on? So um, we are gonna uh, go through the second to last uh, week of activity in the PFCFL. Um, so uh, Jeff is gonna talk about three battles this week because I'm gonna cover uh, more of the kills, standing and stuff like that. Uh, so the first battle was the one between uh, me and you, Jeff, so, so go ahead. All right, so this week, the epic face-off finally happened between me and Frank. Memphis Primates versus Montreal Crawdons. And when I say I planned extremely hard for this one, I spent more time than I should have. And I will say I did make a few last-minute changes. I discussed it with, with uh, Damien. I made a few last-minute changes. And honestly, at the end of the day, they ended up biting me in the ass hard because uh, Frank ended up beating me 3-0. Which, which was really, really depressing because I, I felt really, really good about this week. Um, but again, you know, there was a couple of things that uh, I changed at the end that kind of affected it in the long run. Uh, I took um, I took Stealth Rocks off of my Dawn Fan. I was going to throw them up, you know, to have the residual damage because it would help, you know, pick up some key Okos in the long run um, after Rocks. But uh, I took them off in favor of Rapid Spin. And uh, I threw knockoff on there as well, removing, I forget which other move I had on there. Yeah. But I removed another move for knockoff to, you know, have an extra way of getting rid of the potential Chansey Eviolite, which he didn't even bring, which is really <laughs> depressing. But um, on top of that, uh, the reason I put Rapid Spin on Don Fan was to try and... I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll admit, I did steal a little bit from... Uh, Joey Pokiam, uh in his match recently against uh, A Drive in the ACL in the UCL, my bad. Uh, he used a Focus Sash Weavile with Counter to take out his Mega Metagross, <laughs> and that's exactly the same set I brought. And it really limited me a lot because Weavile couldn't just come in and you know cause crazy damage throughout the match. Because especially once he got Rocks up, I had to preserve the Sash in order for my strategy to even work. So there was plenty of times where Weavile could have come in and picked up an easy kill, but with the rocks up, I couldn't risk it, and it really, really hurt me in the long run of the battle. Um, I ran, I, I, I did do some crazy things as well. I, I may, might have made a few mistakes with it, but you know what can you do? Uh, I brought two assault vested mons, considering typically eight out of. Uh, Frank's 11 Mons are typically run as special attackers, so you know, I, I did that as kind of a kind of an extra defense against uh, a good portion of his team, yeah. uh, being Mew and Electros, who pretty much just couldn't get anything done. Um, Haunter was uh, scarfed, and I made a really poor over prediction with Haunter that ended up costing me it in the long run. Yeah. Uh, with Haunter against his Rotom, I, sh I had Energy Ball and I should have just clicked it and you know made the safest play. But I predicted him to swap out to his Hydreigon to potentially eat an incoming, you know, Shadow Ball, and I went for Dazzling Gleam as he stayed in with the Rotom. And from that point, it was just kind of well, there goes Haunter. He's basically <laughs> used at this point. Yeah, Infernape, oh, code it. <laughs> yep, Infernape was scarfed. Uh, in a ways to outspeed his entire team. Uh, Nat, considering he outspeeds 95% of his team outside of his Raikou naturally, I ran the Scarf on it to guarantee outspeed everything, including Mega Metagross. Um, I ran the Overheat specifically for Mega Metagross because it's less specially bulky than physically bulky. And overall, I, I put a lot of time into prep for the match, and just at the end of the day, it didn't. I prepped too hard and it, it bit me in the ass. So uh, on my side, I'd say uh, Mega Metagross was, was the MVP because pretty much, well, I was switching between him and Jellison and pretty much sponging everything. Uh, both died in the end, but it was just like taking a step back to take two steps forward because I didn't want to uh, to to switch out on a potential. Uh, on a move that would potentially put me in danger 
so I preferred to let them die. Uh, I preferred to win by a 3 nothing score than risk something and probably lose some points. That would have been a, a, a bad thing at the end of the season. So uh, that's it for this battle. So the next battle is Orlando against Atlanta. All right, so this battle actually ended up being a 4-0 forfeit uh, in favor of Atlanta. Uh, it just came down to uh, scheduling conflicts, and it, it came down to like the last hour at the end of the week. Uh, Chase had been busy; he'd been away all week long, so he just kind of decided, he's like, you know what? It, it's it's late. I, I'll just kind of, kind of, I'll, I'll let you have this one, Damien. It's all good, bro. And, you know, it, it, was, it was good that they agreed on it. It was all good. No big deal. But um, basically, uh, the way it was simulated, uh, we looked, uh, Frank looked at the battle, and Damien looked at the battle, and they, they talked about it, and they simulated it. And I, I kind of just put my own a little two cents in it. Um, for on Atlanta side, uh, Gengar, uh, obviously being the specially offensive threat that it is, uh, could easily come in and take out Mons like um, Dustin Wire and... Uh, Cresselia. Cresselia. I thought you said uh, Manaphy as well. Uh, take out Dustin Wire with uh, Shadow Ball. Take out Manaphy with Thunderbolt. Yeah. You know, really, really put in uh, a lot of work. Uh, we said that uh, Mega Pinsir, uh, being the offensive, insane offensive threat that it is, would be able to easily take out Cresselia and Mega Absol yep. with uh, combinations of uh, X Scissor, Return, Quick Attack, any of the above, would do enormous damage to both of them. And especially the quick attack as the priority to uh, go over the uh, Mega Absol and uh, tear through it with it being as frail as it is. Uh, Crobat, we said, would uh, be able to easily take on uh, Tornadus. Uh, Crobat just overall has uh, more bulk than Tornadus, and depending on the set, obviously, that uh, Chase would have brought, uh, Crobat would have been able to find a way around whatever kind of threat he could be giving out and dish out the necessary damage. To to eat through it. Uh, he could have even brought Banded Probat. Banded Probat's a thing I have run before personally, and it, it really does put in a lot of work. Uh, a Banded Brave Bird or even a Banded Cross Poison is going to do insane damage to Tornadus, so we agreed that uh, Crobat would win that matchup 1v1. Uh, then we said that Chandelure would then take on uh, Jolteon. Uh, while Jolteon does have some good special bulk, uh, Chandelure run the right way would be able to uh, pick it off easily, uh, especially if he brought a, uh, say, a Specs Jolteon, uh, tried to lock himself into HP Ice against a mom like uh, Mega Pinsir or Crobat, something like that, he locked himself into HP Ice. Chandelure could easily come in on that and uh, pick him off with a uh, Flamethrower or Fire Blast or Shadow Ball and do massive damage and easily take it out. Uh, for Chase's side, uh, we said that the Manaphy would easily be able to pick up a kill on Rhyperior due to the quad weakness and Manaphy's overall uh, power that it can... It's definitely a threat uh, to any Mon at all, and especially one where the quad weakness is going to take it out one skull and really easy. Uh, and then we agreed that Mega Absol could easily handle Gengar, come in after Gengar picked up you know one or two good kills, Sorry, and uh, at that point, you know, Gengar would... Sucker Punch would be imminent, and Damien would just kind of see that Gengar did its job and allow it to go down. So I think Absol would take out Gengar there, and that's pretty much as much as we can go with. All right, so uh, I'm going to go with the third battle, which is uh, Dundee against Pittsburgh. So uh, this battle was also forfeit, even though there was a battle. Um, it was after it happened that uh, while I was doing the scoreboard, I realized that Pittsburgh brought four OUs and no uh, UU. So it's a rule that you have in this league, you must bring at least one Pokemon per tier. Uh, Casey didn't do that, so even though he had won uh, the battle by a score of 2-0, uh, or 3-0, uh, we had to uh, cancel this battle out and simulate it. So, uh, looking at his team, uh, Mega Alakazam would have been able to pick up 3 kills, so uh, on Slowbro, which isn't the best special wall, uh, Mega Alakazam is pretty much guaranteed Oko or uh, Twit KO, depending on the move, uh, against uh, Slowbro. Uh, Dazzling Beam on, uh, on Sableye, and uh, uh, Psychic on Throw. 
so that's that's pretty much it. Uh, Jirachi probably would have been able to get rid of uh, Miguel Kazam uh, on the long run. Uh, Haluka would have been able to kill uh, Amoongus with uh, with the Sky Attack. Uh, Diancy would have been able to kill uh, to kill Landorus uh, with an air balloon and stuff like that. It can resist uh, the the earthquake. So we think that yeah, he would have been able to uh, kill it with uh, something like HPIs or something. So that's uh, the logic behind it. And uh, Suicune uh, would have been able to uh, finish it off with uh, with its bulk, like pretty much recovering and uh, uh, getting stats up and getting rid of the, its opponent with Scald and stuff like that uh, with the bird. So, um, two kills would have been uh, Jirachi, as I said, on Alakazam, and uh, Sableye would have been able to kill a uh, Trapnet. So that's the logic we came to. Uh, it's kind of bad because uh, Alistair was 0-7, and seven, but now he's 2-7, and seven. he won his last two games, even though it, there was one by forfeit, if he won these two battles uh, earlier in the season, he probably would still be in it. Uh, so uh, him and Chase will battle this week uh, to, for uh, the last position, the position 7 and 8, so uh, the team that will, uh, that will uh, lose will have a better draft pick, but will have the dishonor of being the last team in the league, so that's it. Uh, Jeff, you can continue on with Bradenton against Golden State. Okay, so uh, I'll be honest, I, I just had a chance to sit down and watch this battle, and man, I couldn't take my eyes off the screen for a minute. This is easily uh, one of my favorite battles uh, of the season to watch, personally, from everyone else. Um, overall, team matchup-wise, it, it's really punch for punch between these two. Um, Overall, watching the battle, uh, seeing a Golden State come out with a 2 nothing victory over Bradenton, um, it, it, it was a fantastically played matchup, and, yeah. and each side kind of held the momentum in their own way for a little bit here and there. Um, the start of the battle, right off the bat, um, Andy Chatot. held <laughs> momentum with Chatot, putting insane amounts of pressure, uh, confusing his Dragonite turn one. Uh, with the chatter and just firing off boom bursts and then Dragonite hitting itself in confusion didn't help bringing it all the way down to red HP and then in comes Clawitzer, you know trying to uh, trying to battle back and trying to steal the momentum back and then here comes Ch Chatot, you know smacking the hell out of it and living with a focus sash too that the focus sash became in clutch with, uh, on the ice beam from Clawitzer. Yeah. that was fantastic bringing Clawitzer down to low health and uh, Chatot was able to pick up a kill on a, on the Dragonite sack off uh, shortly after, but man, if, that Chatot is scary, man. It, that was a really smart thing for him to pick up late season, man. That was as a powerhouse right there. Everyone sleeps on Chatot, but man, oh man, you see how much work and pressure it can put on a team. Anything that can learn Boom Burst is something scary because that move is ridiculously broken. I don't, I don't care what anyone says. That move is insane. Uh, Flygon, Flygon was uh, easily the MVP for Andy picking up two kills. Um, not dying. Really, just not dying at all. Yeah, it was it was it was a nice way to close out the match uh, with the outrage at the very very end there. He had nothing at that point that could stop it. Um, Glyscore, uh, toxicing the chestnut. Yep. And my nice safe. I I was blown away with how well this worked out for uh, Martin. Um, I don't know if they knew about it ahead of time, but I, I, I remember I did, and when I watched the battle, I immediately, I, I saw the moment, and I was like, ooh, this is this is good. Uh, Glyscore went for Roost, as, Clyde or, or as, as Chestnut went for Woodhammer, that, which typically would be neutral because of the ground flying typing, but since he went for Roost, you know, everyone knows that when you, the turn you go for Roost, you lose your flying typing, so the Woodhammer ended up being super effective, and that did boatloads of damage. <laughs> I almost took out Glyscore the first time, and then second time around on the Roost, it was able to take it out, but Chestnut eventually fell to the Toxic as well, so it was 
it was a night. It was a really, really interesting part of the match. Re- easily the highlight for me, just because that's a, that's. I think that's one of those aspects of the game that a lot of people forget about when using Roost, and, and a lot of people are are less cautious with. I guess in a lot of cases, because like people will just freely spam Roost in order to you know keep their health up, but they don't realize you know it's putting them at risk, and that is a key reason right there. And that that I was. I don't know if it was a prediction on on Martin's behalf, but that was that was well played, very very well played. Uh, Arcanine uh, putting crazy work as well, picking up two kills. I mean, you don't mess with an Arcanine. That intimidate that intimidate shuts down anything you have going on. It's got extreme speed. That's no move to mess with. That's gonna cause some crazy crazy damage. It, it's overall it, it it put in a lot of work before being finally taken down. Uh, it took out. I remember it took out the Feraligator. That was a that was a great, great moment. The one thing that Andy thought he could handle the Arcanine with, and it just goes down. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, Minetric picked up a kill on uh, Martin's side, but overall, uh, Andy played the match uh, much better. Uh, the later game reflect with the Meow stick that helped a lot as well. Yep. Helped the Sponge a little bit more damage. And Umbreon again picking up another kill and not dying. That thing's just that, that thing always has to come in there and put its two cents in the battle. Let's be real about it. That Umbreon's a scary threat, but Golden State pulling out a two nothing victory over Bradenton this week and in one of in one fantastic match, which is exactly what we thought was gonna happen at this point in the season, so yep. that's what I really gotta say. <laughs> So um, we're gonna go and uh, see how the kills have progressed, the kill leaders. So once again, Mega Metagross is first with 15 kills. Uh, he has uh, 1.67 kills per game and a plus 9 differential. Mega Absol is right behind with 13 kills and 8 deaths, so 1.44 kills per game and a plus 5 differential. After those two Megas come, uh, comes Umbreon. 12 kills and 5 deaths, a plus 7 differential, 1.33 kills per game. Then Mega Pinsir, 11 and 2, 1.83 kills per game. That's pretty much the, the peak of the season, I'd say, uh, on the free agency. Uh, Damien is using it very well, uh, much better than uh, he would have done with Mega Altaria. So it's uh, a very good pickup by him. And after that uh, comes my uh, Jellicent, 11 kills and 6 deaths, it's, a, it's used as a wall, but it always finds a way to, uh, to mess uh, my opponent's plans, <laughs> with 1.57 kills per game and a plus 5 differential. After that come uh, Manectric, Mega Charizard X, Jolteon, Tarantrum, Mega Alakazam, uh, it's the first time we see a Pokemon uh, from uh, Alistair in, the, in this uh, in this list, uh, well, so high in this list, I mean. After that, Gliscor, Electros, Venusaur. Uh, then there's Chandler, Weavile, Diancie, Hydreigon, Mega Scizor, Ledo Key, etc., etc., etc. So I won't go through uh, all of them. So that's it for uh, kill leader, uh, the kill leader, kill, bleh, kill leaderboard. So uh, let's go through the standings. Uh, I'm gonna present the Hoenn Conference and tell you you'll do a Kalos, okay? That sounds good. Okay. So uh, first of all, uh, in the Hoenn Conference is me, the uh, coach of the Montreal Crowdons. I now have a six and three record with 48 kills and 29 deaths. That's a plus 19 differential. After that, there's Damien and the Atlanta Heroes with five five wins and four losses. Uh, and uh, 48, 41 kills and 41 deaths for a, a neutral differential. Casey has 35 kills and 44 deaths uh, in his uh, 4 wins and 5 losses, so that's a minus 9 differential. And then uh, comes Alistair, uh, who's eliminated from the playoffs. Uh, so the Dundee Dark Cry has a 2 and 7 record. 33 kills and 49 deaths. That's a minus 16 differential. So, uh, Jeff, want to go ahead? 
All right, so for the Kalos Conference, we have myself and the Memphis Primates at the top slot with a record of 7-2 and two with uh, 49 kills and 29 deaths with a plus 20 differential. Uh, in second place, we have Martin and the Bradenton Rapid Ashes with a 5-4 and four record with uh, 45 kills and 38 deaths, which leads to a plus 7 differential. Then we have Andy and the Golden State War Turtles in third place with a also having a record of 5 and 4, but the only difference being Andy has uh, 39 kills and 43 deaths, which leads to a minus 4 differential. Yep. In last place, who is also eliminated from the playoffs, but is still fighting for that uh, first uh, first or second playoff or uh, draft slot, is going to be Chase and the Orlando Magic Cars with a record of 2 and 7 with 32 kills and 49 deaths with a minus 17 differential. I find it really interesting how, over the course of a few weeks, Alistair passed up Chase. <laughs> yep. Chase is now technically in last place in the league overall, which is insane to see, because... He beat, uh, he beat, I think, uh, Andy, and who was the other one? Uh, uh he beat Martin, too, I think. No, no, I think he be, I think, wasn't he it? He beat Casey, uh, he beat no, Casey. Be Casey. Casey. Yeah, so I'm a little surprised to see, um, to see Chase, uh, go down that easily, um, after he had a good start to the season, I think it was, uh, 2-3 at a certain point, um, something like that, 2-3 or 2-4, uh, he won against, uh, against Andy and against Casey, or, who are two good competitors, uh, they are gonna make the playoffs, so uh, it's not like he wa he lost against uh, Alistair uh, and another one. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm very surprised that Chase wasn't able to uh, get a better record. But uh, I think that in this league, it's not all up to skills. You got you gotta prepare better than your opponent to win uh, most often than, than none. So. Uh, Chase didn't prepare a lot uh, for certain battles and it clearly uh, showed up. So I think that's why he has this record. Um, when we look at the top of the of the, each conference, uh, it's gonna go uh, down to the wire between you and I. So if I win and you lose, I'm gonna be in first place no matter what. Uh, and, and if we both lose or both win, you're gonna be the champion. So uh, that's pretty much it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's, it, it got really close now, and I'm, I'm, it, it really excites me because the, the closer it is, you know, the more the more interesting it gets, and it's just it, it really is like this last week. There's so much pressure because this last week, I mean, the wins and losses pretty much determine the whole entire you know draft record draft setup for next season. So everyone's going to have to put in a lot of extra work to try and pick up those key wins and losses to get those uh, you know, better or worse uh, draft slots to try and uh, you know, get a, make sure that their team next season you know, fits, that, that they're able to get the mods they need for next season. And yeah. it's going to be, it, it's tight, it's tight. I mean, regardless of what place you're in, you know, I mean, first place, you know, it doesn't matter as much because, you know, you get the last pick anyway in the first couple of rounds, but Overall, it's it's especially for the middle of the pack. It's really really close right now between uh, Damian, Martin, and Andy. It's insanely close. Any one of them could end up with the um, with the the top spot, the, yeah. their their top spot in to uh, to scoop up the better picks, you know, or the worst picks. You know, it, it, it all comes down to the third from third place down to fifth place is. I, I can't honestly determine it at this point because if Martin gets a really bad loss this week and say Andy gets a really it, basically if Andy wins this week, Martin loses this week, Andy hops ahead of him. Damian wins this week, he hops up in the in the middle or ahead of both of them. It's no matter what goes down, you know, it's the entire middle of the of the conference is, is completely undetermined at this point. And there's and, and then you know with Casey, you know if if Andy loses and Casey wins. Then Casey hops ahead of Andy, yeah. so it's it's close. It's really close, and that really excites me for next season's draft. Yeah. So.
so uh, that's it for the standings and here is the schedule for the PFCL, the PFCFL week 10 so the last week of uh, the regular season so you face uh, Andy and the uh, Golden State Port Turtles Chase and the Orlando Magic are face Alistair that's going to be a matchup for uh, the the first uh, the best draft pick in the first four round of the or left or next draft I can't speak what's wrong with me <laughs> then I'm gonna battle uh, Martin and the uh, Bridgerton Rapid Ashes and uh, Casey and the Pittsburgh Steelixes are gonna uh, battle the Atlanta Heroes coached by Damian so that's pretty much it uh, so Jeff do you wanna have last word I'm really excited for this week, especially because I've got something to prove. Andy pulled up. Andy was the one who gave me my first loss this season. I got something to prove. I'm coming out for revenge, Andy. You best be watching out. I'm coming full force, man. There ain't nothing stopping me from picking up a win this week. All right, so um, that's it for this video. Thank you guys for watching. Please leave a like, comment, subscribe, follow me on Twitter and on Twitch. Uh, if you guys want to uh, follow the PFCFL from the inside, the link to the group will be in the description below. Um, just so you guys know, uh, next week, uh, at the beginning of next week, we will have the draft for our season two. We already have the 16 coaches, so uh, it's gonna be the the order is gonna be mixed up between um, new competitors and the order uh, from uh, last season. So it's gonna be. Uh, we already know that Maxim Duquet uh, with uh, Quebec Antes is going to draft first. And we know that uh, either Jeff or I will draft last in the first four rounds. So it's a will draft. Uh, rounds one to four have the same order. After that, rounds uh, five to eight, uh, the order is reversed. And after that, the, or the, it's a will draft for the last four rounds. Uh, the format uh, is going to be a little different, but we're going to talk about it in the uh, next video. So, uh, that's it. Thank you guys for watching, and peace!